This page was created to teach black history. Unfortunately, the American educational system was designed to exclude our real historical account. So we are here to dismantle it. It's time to enlighten those of us who have been kept in the dark. I am a black man who didn't know enough about my own history. So I began to dig deeper and do my own research. Black history is American history. So I want people of all races and cultures to join together to learn our history as one. Here, I will share all of my findings. Please like, follow, share, and subscribe to Teaching Black History. The story of Mary McLeod Bethune. McLeod was born in 1875 in a small log cabin near Maysville, South Carolina on a rice and cotton farm in Smutner County. She was the 15th of 17 children born to Sam and Patsy McLeod, both former slaves. Most of her siblings had been born into slavery. Her parents wanted to be independent, so they had sacrificed to buy a farm for the family. As a child, Mary would accompany her mother to deliver white people's wash. Allowed to go into the white children's nursery, Mary became fascinated with their toys. One day she picked up a book and she opened it. A white child snatched it away from her, babbling she didn't know how to read. Mary decided then that the only difference between white and colored people was the ability to read and write. She was inspired to learn. McLeod attended Maysville one-room black schoolhouse, Trinity Mission School. She was the only child in her family to attend school. So each day, she taught her family what she had learned. To get to and from school, Mary walked five miles each day. Her teacher, Emma Jane Wilson, became a significant mentor in her life. Bethune worked as a teacher briefly at her former elementary school in Sumner County. In 1896, she became teaching at Haynes Normal, an industrial institute in Augusta, Georgia, which was part of the Presbyterian mission organized by Northern congregations. It was founded and run by Lucy Craft Laney as the daughter of former slaves Lane ran her school with a Christian missionary zeal, emphasizing character and practical education for girls. She also accepted boys who showed up eager to learn. Laney's mission was to embody Christian moral education in her students to arm them for their life challenges. Of her year at Laney's school, Bethune said, I was so impressed with her fearlessness, her amazing touch in every respect and energy that seemed intoxicating and her mighty power to command respect and admiration from her students and all who knew her. She handled her domain with the art of a master. McLeod adopted many of Laney's educational philosophies including her emphasis on educating girls and women to improve the conditions of black people. I believe that the greatest hope of the development of my race lies in training our women thoroughly and practically. After her marriage and moved to Florida, Bethune became determined to start a school for girls. She moved to Daytona because it had more economic opportunity. It had become a popular tourist destination and businesses were thriving. In October, 1904, she rented a small house for $11 per month. She made benches and desks from discarded crates and acquired other items through charity. Bethune used $1.50 to start the educational and industrial training school for Negro girls. She initially had six students, five girls aged six to 12 and her son Albert. 
the school, boarded Daytona's dump. Bethune, parents, students, and church members raise money by making sweet potato pies, ice cream, and fried fish, and selling them. In the early days, the students made ink for pens from elderberry juice and pencils from burned wood. They asked local businesses for furniture. The school received donations of money, equipment, and labor from local black churches. Within a year, Bethune was teaching more than 30 girls at the school. Bethune also courted wealthy white organizations, such as the Ladies Palmito Club. She invited influential white men to sit on her school board of trustees and the rigorous curriculum had the girls rise at 5.30 a.m. for Bible study, the classes in home economics and industrial skills such as dressmaking, cooking, and other crafts emphasized a life of self-sufficiency for these women. Students' day ended at 9 p.m. Soon Bethune added science and business courses, then high school level courses of math, English, and foreign languages. In 1931, the Methodist Church helped the merger of her school with the Boys Cookman Institute, forming the Bethman Cookman College, a co-educational junior college. But by 1941, the college had developed a four-year curriculum, achieved full college status. As of the early 1900s, Daytona Beach was lacking a hospital that would help people of color. Bethune had the idea to start a hospital after an incident involving one of her students. She was called to the bedside of a young female student who fell ill with acute appendicitis. It was clear that the student needed immediate medical attention, yet there was no local hospital to take her. Bethune demanded that the white physician at the local hospital help the girl. When Bethune went to visit her student, she was asked to enter through the back door. At the hospital, she found that her student had been neglected, ill cared for, and segregated on an outdoor porch. Out of this experience, Bethune decided the black community in Daytona needed a hospital. She found a cabin near the school, and through sponsors helping her raise money, she purchased it for $5,000. In 1911, Bethune opened the first black hospital in Daytona, Florida. It started with two beds and within a few years held 20. Both white and black physicians worked at the hospital, along with Bethune's student nurses. This hospital went on to save many black lives within the 20 years that it operated. During that time, both black and white people in the community relied on help from the McLeod Hospital. In 1896, the National Association of Colored Women was formed to promote the needs of black women. Bethune served as the Florida chapter president from 1917 to 1925. She worked to register black voters, which was resisted by white society and had been made almost impossible by a variety of obstacles in Florida law and practices controlled by white administrators. She was threatened by members of the KKK in those years. Bethune also served as the president of the Southeastern Federation of Colored Women's Clubs from 1920 to 1925, which worked to improve opportunities for black women. In 1935, Bethune founded the National Council of Negro Women in New York City, bringing together representatives of 28 different organizations to work to improve the lives of black women in their communities. The National Youth Administration was a federal agency created under Reservoir Works Progress Administration. Bethune lobbied the organization so aggressively and effectively for minority involvement 
that she earned a full-time staff position in 1936 as an assistant. Bethune was appointed to a position of director of the Division of Negro Affairs and as such became the first African-American female division head. Bethune became a close and loyal friend of Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt at the Southern Conference on Human Welfare in 1938, held in Birmingham, Alabama, Eleanor Roosevelt requested a seat next to McLeod despite state segregation laws. Roosevelt frequently referred to McLeod as her closest friend in her age group. McLeod told black voters about the work being done on their behalf by the Roosevelt administration and made their concerns known to the Roosevelts. She had unprecedented access to the White House through her relationship with the First Lady. She used her access to form a coalition of leaders from black organizations called the Federal Council of Negro Affairs, but which came to be known as the Black Cabinet. It served as an advisory board to the Roosevelt administration on issues facing black people in America. This was the first collective of black people working in higher positions in government. It suggested to voters that the Roosevelt administration cared about black concerns. She co-founded the United States Negro College Fund on April 25, 1944 with William J. Trent and Frederick D. Patterson. The UNCF is a program which gives many different scholarships, mentorships, and job opportunities to African Americans and minority students attending any of the 37 historical black colleges and universities. On May 18, 1955, McLeod died of a heart attack. Her death was followed by editorial tributes in African-American newspapers across the United States. The Oklahoma City Black Dispatch stated she was exhibit number one for all who have faith in America and the democratic process. The Atlanta Daily World said her life was one of the most dramatic careers ever enacted at any time upon the stage of human activity. The mainstream press praised her as well. Christian Century suggested the story of her life should be taught to every school child for generations to come. The New York Times noted she was one of the most potent factors in the growth of interracial goodwill in America. Her hometown newspaper, the Daytona Beach Evening News printed, to some, she seemed unreal, something that could not be. What right had she to greatness? The lesson of Mrs. Bethune's life is that genius knows no racial barriers.